Many of you watched part one, the installation of Raspberry Pi OS, Pi Hole, and Unbound on a Raspberry Pi. And clearly, you are legends, because there were over 300 successful installs in six days. And that's just the installs that you told me about. And that's with many of you not even having received your equipment yet. As with most of my videos, I notice trends that form in the comments, and it's usually a good indicator of what I've missed or didn't communicate clearly. I try to be good about answering everything, but sometimes a follow-up video is best because I don't think most of you are just reading through all the comments. So much like I did with my follow-up video to Smart TV Surveillance, I extracted the comments from the video via the YouTube Data API and created a word cloud of the comments. Come on, I'm sure you expect me to do that kind of thing. Here are the most common topics and themes. Number one, the voting is in. People agree that the only thing better than pie is more pie. You spoke and I listened. I'm currently working on a bulletproof video showing the install of Nebula Sync on a dual pie hole setup. The observant amongst you may say, wait, I thought he was going to show us gravity sync. Well, that's what I used to have set up back in my pie hole V5 days. Then I installed V6. I didn't update my syncing because I manually handled the config syncing with teleport. As it happens, gravity sync stopped being a thing, so you get Nebula instead. The install is even faster than getting a pie hole going, so it should be a fun project if you're interested. Number two. Plenty of people haven't done the project yet because they don't have the equipment just laying around. Unsurprisingly, there were a lot of questions regarding where one would even source a Raspberry Pi and a lot of questions about which one they should get. If you don't have a local micro center, which you probably don't, I recommend going out to raspberrypi.com. They'll show you who the authorized resellers are in your country. Regardless of where you get one, just understand that the retailers will upcharge you for bundles, so just make sure that you're getting a decent value if you get a kit. Number three. Next, you wanted to know which Raspberry Pi you should get. There are a lot of choices. Possibly counterintuitively, I don't really recommend getting a Raspberry Pi 5. They cost a lot right now, and they generally require active cooling. I used a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with 1 gig of RAM, currently $40 in the video, and it's great. Alternatively, a Pi 4B with 2 gig of RAM for $45 is great too. If you're on a tight budget or need a second Pi for the redundancy project, I recommend getting a Pi 02W, which is currently $15. Four, then you need a micro SD card. Some in the comments mentioned that micro SD cards don't necessarily have a lot of write endurance and will fail in time. That's true, but there's not a lot of write activity in this application. If you buy an okay brand like SanDisk or PNC, you'll be fine. Besides, you're creating a high availability dual Pi setup anyway, right? Five, if you want to put your project in a little case, that's not a bad idea. You can 3D print one, or there are dozens that you can pick from online. Or you can be like me and just use an old Netflix DVD mailer as your non-conducting, uh, open air case. Six. Several people asked about non-Raspberry Pi Pi Hole installations. And sure enough, you can install it on almost anything. Old hardware, routers, oh, and containers or other virtualized instances. I can help with those, but that definitely is outside the scope of the walkthrough. Seven, I was really nervous about doing a tutorial as that's a bit different from most of my normal content, but mom the creative would tell you that I tend to expect the worst. As I said, there have been hundreds of successful installs at this point. So with that, I can declare that the worksheet concept was a hit, sort of anyway. Some people missed the correct copy and paste of the root hints, which then cascaded into an issue with the unbound configuration. And then some people experienced an issue with NTP. In response, I've updated the worksheet so you should have a smoother time when you install your second pie hole. Eight. On the site, I have a separate post that covers a setting that I didn't mention in part one. It's local forwarding. And while not having the setting in place doesn't keep your network from working, it does make characterizing your DNS traffic harder than it needs to be. It also keeps you from being able to ping some devices on your LAN by name. The link to the post about local forwarding is in the video description below. Nine, several of you asked about block lists. I am not an expert on block lists because my household requires more conservative ad blocking. Why? 
Well, if it's too aggressive, mom the creative and the brat stalls will get mad about their sites breaking. And that's something I should have mentioned. The more aggressive the ad blocking, the higher chance that a site will break. The proper selection of block list tailors the experience to your tolerances and expectations. Here are some popular block lists and their approximate aggro level. 10. In the event that a block list is blocking things that you want to see, you can certainly remove the block list, but you can also whitelist the host. Not only that, but you can create groups inside of the pie hole and attach client devices to them. That allows you to apply different block lists to different client devices, which allows for a fine-tuned experience. You can set your IoT devices to one level of blocking while having another for your phones, laptops, and desktop PCs. You can also create groups of one if you want and exclude blocking from some devices altogether. It's very flexible. 11. There were a number of questions about the Raspberry Pi only having one Ethernet port, and the related questions about the speed of the port possibly affecting network speeds. The implied misunderstanding is that poorly matched router port speeds can throttle internet communication. That would be true with a router, but the Pi hole is not acting as a router. Traffic is not flowing through it, and instead, DNS requests are really all that it's seeing. Even a humble Pi 2.0 will not slow you down, and it won't affect gaming, voice over IP, and work VPN connections either. And regarding company VPN connectivity, it's very likely that when you're connected, the VPN will actually override your local DNS settings anyway. 12. Apparently, your routers suck, especially in the UK. I'm kind of joking, but not really. Many of you are stuck with ISP-provided equipment, and it's generally because it's an all-in-one that's acting as a media interface, for example, to DSL, cable, fiber, cellular, or satellite, also acting as the router and as a wireless access point. That's generally a recipe for poo. And these poo-based routers aren't allowing many of you to specify the DNS server advertisement for your DHCP range. Fear not, though. There are still options. A. You can manually set the DNS on your devices, which is inconvenient, but works just fine. B. You can attach a real router to your ISP's router. Within this option, you will automatically be in what's called a double NAT configuration. This does not require you to do anything with your ISP's equipment. It's not ideal, but it's easy. And C. The alternative is to put your ISP's router into something called pass-through, bridge, or bypass mode provided that it supports it. This is definitely preferable. With either B or C, you should stop using your ISP's Wi-Fi connectivity. 13. You've got your pie hole now. You've got Unbound. Mission accomplished, right? Well, sort of. Like I mentioned in the earlier DNS filtering video, that's the one before the pie hole installation. There are rogue devices that don't honor your advertised DNS server. After all, DHCP listing your DNS server or servers is a suggestion, not a rule. But what devices do this? Something like this? Surprisingly, probably not, but these do. And they can bypass your DNS filtering using hard-coded DNS. Roku, PlayStation, Chromecast, and Google TV do this. Some apps use DOH or DNS over HTTPS. Some Google services do this, as does Xbox and some Apple apps. It's not just those devices, but much of the universe of IoT devices too, including cameras, smart plugs, light bulbs, anything from Amazon, Google, Xiaomi, and your smart appliances. Stormwash, remember? Stopping it isn't hard if you have a decent router with a firewall. You can, one, block all outbound DNS traffic on port 53, except for your pie hole and unbound setup. This stops all of the normal DNS bypass traffic instantly. Two, Block outbound DOT encrypted DNS traffic on port 853. This stops DOT resolution like Android private DNS, Quad9 DOT, and Cloudflare DOT. 3. Block known DOH resolvers. This is tougher because it's a list of specific hosts. This makes it a pain to add, but there's a list of common resolvers to block port 443 here. And 4. Redirect outbound traffic to port 53 on your pie hole. This is an alternative to number one, but I wouldn't say that it's better. 
Also, because you don't know every DOH target out there and because apps sometimes pin their certificates, you may not be able to catch everything. Sometimes though, almost everything is good enough and taking these steps should stop almost everything. 14. The last question that came up a surprisingly large number of times was how you could access your DNS filtering on the go. In retrospect, it makes sense. You now have a great filtering setup at home, but then you get carpet bombed with ads as soon as you're out on 5G again. What you should find unsurprising at this point is that there are solutions for that too. You can, one, use dynamic DNS and map port 53 through your router to your pie hole. This requires a router that lets you map a port along with you not being double natted, including CGNAT. Two, use tail scale or twin gate. This is a really cool option that allows you to access your LAN and or a host on it, like your pie holes, from anywhere. It works even if you have a potato for a router or if you're double natted. It also lets you use your dual pies. Three, stand up a normal VPN server at home and connect to it. This has similar drawbacks to number one, but does have the advantage of letting you access multiple pie holes in your redundant configuration. And four, stand up a VPN server on a VPS or lease server and connect to it. This is probably the best option, but it is usually also the most expensive one too. Additional benefits of this are that you can probably stop using a third party VPN provider and you can share the VPN and pie hole with friends and family. 15, but I'm still seeing ads. This was another common comment, and what I can say is that just like you're trying to circumvent seeing ads, advertisers are trying to circumvent your filtering methods. Nothing will enable you to never see an ad again. The more aggressive the block lists you use, the more ads you'll stop. And per number 13, the more you prevent DNS sneaking past your pie hole, the more effective your pie hole will be. Finally, it's not just the ads you're blocking, it's also the telemetry and data collection. I would argue that while you can't see the tracking like you can see the ads, it's actually more valuable as it makes the digital profile being culled from your activities much more sparse. And finally, number 16. I'm curious, what's your favorite Christmas movie? Is it Die Hard, Gremlins, or something else? Let me know. By now, you probably know what's coming next. If you want a more detailed video on any of the topics I mentioned in this video, like setting up tail scale on your Raspberry Pi, let me know in the comments. If you found this video interesting or helpful, hit like, subscribe, and share this with anyone else that may not know that their Pi Hole or AdGuard home setup may not be catching everything. If you want to support my work, please hype the video and consider becoming a member. I'm not a big deal, so it's really cheap. Depending on the tier, we can hang out in Discord, so there's that. And while I hate to ask for money, these videos take a surprising amount of time to make, and the more specific they get, the fewer people watch them. Speaking of members, I want to thank new members, H Panther, J, Freedom USA, Lou, Mike, QT, Greg, Norm, Jack, Norbert, Lawrence, and Alberto for their support. It helps make these videos possible, and members will automatically be entered to win the Raspberry Pi raffle, with four prizes, including two Raspberry Pis, after I complete the AdGuard home video. Thanks, and have a great and ad-free day.